Hi there. Microphone working. Lovely people. Nice to see you. I hope you're having a great day. I'll get started right away because I want to tell you a lot. So, I'm working on Cashew, which is a Charmin eCash system that we're building on Bitcoin. And Charmin eCash is a fascinating technology that that uh, the guy invented that I'm going to tell you about. So first, let's talk about cash. For hundreds of years, we've been enjoying the most privacy-preserving, unstoppable, uncensorable money that we ever used, which is good old physical cash. I give it to you, you give it to someone else, there is no one who can track you or stop you, right? But as we all know, most of our lives are not physical anymore. Most of our lives are trending to become online. So. I think, and many of us will agree, that our online lives deserve a digital equivalent, something that is close or similar to physical cash. Well, Bitcoin has ridden us from the trusted third party. So with Bitcoin, we can build money systems without the permission of anyone. However, fundamental scaling problems of the Bitcoin blockchain and blockchains in general means that still most users of Bitcoin are using custodial services today. This is the reality that we live in today. So I want to introduce you to this guy. This is David Chaum, a prolific, incredible cryptographer who was very forward thinking already in the 80s. He knew that most of our lives will be online. And he knew that in order for democracy to flourish, we need not only freedom of speech, we also need freedom of transaction. So he was very, very forward thinking. And back in 1982, this is the first moment where digital currencies come into the conversation. So this is the genesis of what we're experiencing today. And in 1982, David Chom comes up with the system called electronic cash or e-cash. And the idea is simple. So the idea is that a bank issues currency to their users, as you can see up here, that the users can exchange peer to peer, right? So that's the idea. And with this currency, with this digital currency, David Trump already knew that we could then enable web payments. So help the web itself monetize by allowing people to transact privately and at the same time also give a revenue stream for the upcoming online world that we're going to build. And remember, this is 82. This is way before normal people are on the internet. So it was very, very, very early. So eCash is amazing. It has many properties like cash. It is private. It's uncensorable. It's basically unstoppable. I can give you eCash, no one can stop you, can, can stop me. No users, no databases, but it's electronic. So it's instant, you can use it offline, I can just hand it over to you, or you can use it online. I can make online payments with this. So here's a very short description of how it works. This is Alice. Alice uses, is a user of a bank. That's the idea of David Chom, how it's supposed to be. So Alice uses a bank, and the bank runs something called an e-cashment. So you can imagine this similar to an ATM machine, right? So Alice has a bank account with a couple bucks in there, and goes to the bank and says, please, can I have some e-cash? What the bank does is gives you a little piece of electronic data and sends it over to Alice. Alice received this digital piece of data that she then puts in her device, similar how you put electronic, like a piece of paper into your wallet. Alice can then send this over to Carol. For example, Carol is selling her something on, on the internet. And Carol can collect the digital cash while she's selling stuff online, and later go back to the mint, to the bank, and say, hey, I'd like to withdraw this. And you can see here the interface from the early 90s. So this is very cool. And everyone thought so. So everyone loved this idea. Microsoft, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, Citibank, you name it. They were all on board, wanted a piece of the, a piece of the cake. However, there is one big problem with this idea. The whole thing, in order to work, needs the banking system. It needs the cooperation of the banks in order to be deployed. No one can deploy this except for the banks. So what happened? This sounds like a great idea. Why don't we, why don't we have this reality? So eventually, all of these deals failed. Depends on you know, when you look into the history why. There are many different reasons, but one of the most important reasons is that it depends on the cooperation with the banks. And then a decade later, this was so early that a decade later, decade later, credit cards and PayPal and all the payment industry that we see today took over the internet. So quo vadis e cash. Then comes 2008. 
Satoshi proposes Bitcoin, a truly decentralized electronic cash system that does not rely on trusted third parties, as opposed to the idea of David Schaum here. So we thought, what if we took the idea that was back then proposed in 82 and just move it over to the new financial system that we're building? So and that's what we're doing with the Cash protocol. We're building e-cash systems on top of Bitcoin. So with Cashew, you can enable private, fast, scalable, super easy and lightweight payments that work offline with NFCs, QR codes, you name it. Whatever can transport data can transport eCash. There has been a lot of writing and theorizing about what this means also for the future of the financial system that we might build on top of Bitcoin. But I also see this as a new way of designing protocols, new way of designing custodians, new way of designing banks, and enabling true and real micropayments on the internet, and hopefully allowing the internet to finance itself, to be driven by the users themselves, instead of, for example, selling your data or selling your ad ads in order to monetize. So that's the Cashew protocol, and we've invented this one and a half years ago, and since then a lot has happened. So there is a thriving community of people, independent developers, independent users, and, and teams that are building uh, all interoperable software with different wallets and mints. And specifically on Nostr, we see a lot of activity because Nostr gives us the, the, the underlying Pay, uh, the underlying network to send around data together with identities to send to specific people. So you can check out more if you follow the link in the, in the bottom here. So why is this even working today? And as I, as I alluded before, the reason is Bitcoin. Because if you have a mint that services like 100 people, and the mint issues digital currency to their, to their users, only these 100 people will come to enjoy this. So what happens with the other people who are using a different mint, right? And again, in the 90s, the idea was that the banks would do the interoperability between these entities. But today, we don't need that anymore. As Elizabeth just said in a previous talk, Lightning and Bitcoin becomes the connecting tissue for subsystems of Bitcoin. And this is what we're already seeing. This is how we can make a thousand mints out there. This is the reason why we can deploy this on a mass scale and have it interoperable between each other because Bitcoin connects everything. So, I'd like to take one step back and become a little bit more nerdy. So, I think the internet is completely broken. And I guess many of you, or people at least who spend a lot of time on the internet, agree with this. And there are many different interpretations of why the inter internet is broken. But from my point of view, the biggest reason why the internet is broken is because payments are broken. And they've been broken from day one. I'm going to tell you why. Payments are literally the antithesis to anonymity. So when you go to a website and you want to read an article, as you know, most of, the, uh, most of the media has transitioned into the digital realm. And obviously, they need a way to finance themselves. So how do you feel when you click a political article and the website asks you to enter your personal data there? Right? I think you don't feel well. And on the flip side, a related problem to that is we have privacy tools, like amazing tools like Signal, which I recommend to everyone, that require you to identify in order to protect themselves from botnets and from overuse, right? So we see that on the internet, you have two choices for anonymous systems. Either you require the user to make an account, which harms their privacy, or you require the user to make a payment, which harms their privacy. eCash fixes this. And I shouldn't have said eCash fixes this. I should have said Bitcoin fixes eCash. Because eCash is super old, and it failed. And today, we have a sound monetary layer on which we can build the next generation of financial services on top. So the idea was very simple. From the beginning, eCash should have been everywhere. That was the vision. It should have been this guy selling merchandise on a beach with a bad internet connection, up to these guys making thousands of transactions per second from machine to machine. But with Bitcoin, we can finally reach this, and eCash allows us to apply Bitcoin from this very slow, very rudimentary, very human payment to a very fast, extremely high throughput environment. 
So if you're interested, please join us. We're looking for developers. Join us to contribute. However you want, you can find more information on cashew.space. Thank you.